Good morning, everyone. My name is Maya Luria with TMC for Seniors, and we are in the middle of our heart month. And today we're going to be learning all about nutrition and heart smart eating for your health. Mary Malady is here with us. Mary has been with TMC and she is the director of Connected Health and Wellness. She is also a registered dietitian and she provides such great information for us to keep us healthy. Um, you know, on a regular basis, we get, we get to learn from Mary. So I'm glad you're back, Mary. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. So, All right. So yeah, let me put your PowerPoint up um, for for everybody to be able to see at home and you should be good to go. Thank you. All right, well, good morning online and in the room with me. It's so nice to have people back with me in the room versus just talking to myself. Uh, makes it a little bit easier and I'm not going quite so crazy. All right, so it is heart month and a few of you have a little bit of red on and I am so amiss that I did not wear red. I should have worn red. That was silly of me, but I made my presentation red, so there it is. Um, so we're talking about um, how to eat healthy for our heart. And just as a caveat, most every talk I give and whatever I'm talking about nutrition, it's generally healthy for our heart. So if we eat healthy for our heart, we're also protecting our brain. We're also doing the right thing for our weight, for our joints, for chronic disease. So keep that in mind. It's not like you have to choose a specific healthy diet if you have different things going on with you medically. Pretty much the one diet I'm gonna talk about, the diet I talked about probably a few weeks ago, is gonna be the same thing, okay? So think about this as reinforcement if you watched last month's presentation, because I'm not really changing what I'm, what I'm, what I'm talking here. Which is good because how many of you read something about nutrition and the very next month it's different yeah should we eat eggs should we not eat eggs should i eat dairy should i not eat dairy it changes right and the reason for that is nutrition is relatively a new like growing and developing science that we're learning more and more and more for the longest time we just ate food right and we didn't really put a lot of thought into the food that we were eating because we went and ate whatever we picked or whatever we harvest or farmed or we had on our, you know, on our ranch. But now we have so many different food options and we have so many companies doing um, things to food to change its original format. And hence, we're having a lot of people then now study um, how all these different foods affect our body and how we can really make food medicine. Food is medicine. Um, so, Let's talk about our heart. Today, we're gonna to talk about um, heart healthy foods. What are the heart healthy foods? What foods you should avoid that are um, not so healthy for our heart? What are some healthy eating tips? So not just food. So when we think about our, um, our nutrition, I like to preface or I like to talk about it in what we eat, why we eat, and how we eat. All three of those things play a huge role in our nutritional health, okay? So that's why I have eating tips. I have some fads, myths, and truths. We're gonna talk about healthy habits because not only what we eat impacts our health, but there's a lot of just kind of healthy habits in our life that we help to support our nutritional health that can help um, improve our heart health. And then, I have decided to add a recipe idea with each one of my presentations. So I have a pretty cool recipe for you. It sounded really yummy yesterday when I was putting this presentation together, so that's why I picked it. Um, but you all have the handout, so um, if you um, need a bigger blow up of the recipe, I can also get that to you. All right, so let's get going. All right, heart healthy foods. Not shocking. Vegetables and fruits are um, our number one way we want to help our heart. When we talk about the plate, everybody knows what the plate is. We always talk about half your plate should be vegetables and fruit. And how many of you are used to saying fruits and vegetables versus vegetables and fruits? Does one seem more awkward than the other? 
Yeah, I used to say fruits and vegetables. That's how I grew up, fruits and vegetables. And, and so it's like putting on the wrong pant leg first. Does everybody put the same pant leg on first? And when you switch, it's just like, oh, it doesn't feel quite right. Um, well, same vegetables and fruit kind of feels like that for a lot of us. But we're really wanting to get that switch because we want you to enjoy more vegetables and then augment those vegetables with fruit. Why? Um, not because fruit's any less healthy, but because fruit carries with it a lot more calories, just because there's a lot more natural sugar um, in fruits that add to the calorie content versus that of vegetables. And because most of us are all wanting to monitor how many calories we're eating, how much quantity of food we're eating, that's why we're gonna push that vegetable first. Um, vegetables and fruits, they're a great source of fiber, vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients. Those are those special little chemicals in the plants that help us um, with our digestive processes, help with our gut biome. So uh, that's one thing I'm not gonna talk about today is gut health because every other time I talk about gut health, but just know having a healthy gut helps your heart. We talked about that. So fruits and vegetables, vegetables and fruit are good for our gut because of that fiber, because of those phytochemicals, uh, because they feed that microbiome colony in our gut. Um, we always like to encourage fresh vegetables and fruit whenever possible because you're going to get more of that nutritional value from the fiber um, if it has not been canned or juiced. Um, fresh and frozen are equally nutrient dense. Um, and so a lot of people will ask, what about smoothies? Smoothies are fine as long as you're using the whole fruit in the smoothie or the whole vegetable and not using a vegetable juice or fruit juice as your source of vegetable fruit. Because when you use the fruit, even if you're squeezing it yourself, you're removing a lot of the fiber. So, and that's an important aspect of that vegetables and fruit. My husband squeezed a whole bunch of orange juice and he said, that's just as good as, as eating oranges, right? And I said, no, it's not. Um, yeah, I hated to burst his bubble because he was really trying. So think about that. Think about eating the rainbow. Eat a variety of colors. Make your plate beautiful or your snacks very colorful and beautiful um, because vegetables and fruit offer all of those different colors. Try to not just get honed in on one vegetable because every single color of that vegetable and fruit offers a little bit different nutrient profile. Some might have a little more B vitamins, some might have a little more vitamin C, some might have some vitamin K. So think about eating that variety of colors, okay? Um, whole grains is our next health, heart, heart healthy food. And when I say whole grains, I mean it's an unprocessed grain. It hasn't been um, bleached. It hasn't been, so it's not white rice or a white pasta. It hasn't been added to, so there's no sauce to it. There's no flavorings or seasonings. It's a whole unprocessed grain that you might find like in brown rice or quinoa or um, farro. If you haven't tried farro, it's very nice. It's like a nutty flavor. Um, and you can use those in different ways as side dishes, add them to soups. Um, when you're thinking about like bread products, make sure the first ingredient is 100% whole grain wheat or whole wheat flour. Okay, that's the kind of bread that you're looking for if you're gonna opt for bread versus just a brown colored bread, all right? Um, when you're thinking about other kinds of bready products, corn tortilla is a whole grain versus the flour tortilla. Um, let me think, whole wheat, um, there's also whole wheat tortillas out there. Whole wheat pita bread is a good option that we use for some of our recipes. Um, and then um, you can find some whole grain crackers, but I'm finding them less and less frequently now, and I don't know why that is. Maybe it's where I'm shopping, but that might be good. Um, you could also make your own kind of snack food, snack chips out of corn tortillas. They're whole grain. If you just cut them up and bake them in the oven, there's no fat added to them and they're crispy, and you're getting a whole grain product. So there's your tip. Um, whole grains are a good source of fiber as well. 
that fiber is important. That's what you're going to see in that vegetables and fruit and that whole grain and um, B vitamins, right? Uh, low fat dairy. And uh, I'm going to save the, the discussion around whole fat versus whole fat dairy for another slide. So we're recommending um, non-fat 1% or 2% um, dairy, whether that's as milk or as um, yogurt or cottage cheese or something of that nature. Choose a low fat dairy if you're going to choose dairy. Um, plant alternatives may not offer the same nutritional benefits. So what I did, because I get a lot of questions about the different kinds of milk options out there, whether you're choosing an almond, a soy, um, oat milk's really um, big right now. So I went ahead and put the calories how much protein is in each one, calcium content versus vitamin D content as compared to cow's milk. And when I chose the cow's milk, I chose a skim. So that's why the um, calorie is only 91. But in, if you'll look at this, you'll notice that cow's milk has a considerable um, more protein. And I will also preface this by saying a lot of these other, like the almonds or the oats milks, may have a high protein option. So when I did the comparison, I just picked the straight plain oat milk. Um, but like there's the soy milk um, has an extra high protein content because actually this one now that I'm thinking about it probably was the protein plus um, soy milk. But a lot of these to that point have extra protein added as like a pea protein um, added in there to give you some extra protein if you're looking for a non-cow um, non-animal source of milk. Um, calcium content, you can see, is fairly um, good in most of the other plant-based milks. And then the vitamin D content, of course, is going to be the highest in the cow. But um, a lot of you might already be taking a vitamin D supplement um, prescribed by your doctor. So that may not be as big of an issue that you're trying to get that vitamin D from your milk. Okay. Um, and so uh, thinking about that low fat, thinking about um, where, how can you best use that dairy if you're going to choose dairy um, to get you some more nutritional benefits. So the idea of yogurt and Greek yogurt is something to think about because not only are you getting that protein, you're getting the calcium, you're getting some vitamin D, you're also getting a fermented, you're getting those live cultures, which again is good for our gut. A happy gut is a happy heart. Um, low fat sources of protein. So I didn't um, specify whether it's animal or plant, um, but we do like to encourage a meatless day once a week um, to try to get some more of those vegetables in your diet, use some more beans, things of that nature. Um, so when you're looking for an animal for non animal source of protein, beans are a good option. Um, nuts are a great option if you don't want to use a soy base like a tofu or something. We do recommend fish twice a week for heart health, and that's because of the omega-3 fatty acids. And I'll talk a little bit more um, when we move down about the omega-3 fatty acids and why we recommend fish versus supplementation. Um, and then looking for, so when I say you're looking for low-fat sources of protein, Look for visible signs um, or, and hidden sources of fat. So you know when you're going to choose your meat at the grocery store, ground beef is very easy because it already tells you, is this 80-20, is this 96-4, is this 97-3. If you can tolerate and, or, and it's palatable for you, 97-3 ground beef is the best because it's the lowest in that extra fat. Um, but sometimes the labels don't say exactly what the percentage of lean to fat is, but you can actually see it sometimes in the meats that we buy. There might be marbling, and actually those are probably the more tasty cuts of beef because fat carries flavor, but it is not always good for our heart. When we're thinking poultry, all the skin on the outside of the poultry, you can cook with it on, but don't eat it, take it off afterwards because that's where a lot of the saturated fat resides is in that skin, right? And when I say hidden sources of fat, this is um, my little caution for you. If you're going to choose um, a vegetarian option, a, 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 like a, re a meat replacement, 
read the labels because a lot of those replacement items, whether it's, uh, you know, like a Beyond Burger or um, the now they have the Beyond Chicken, things like that, they're really high in saturated fats. Some of those products are um, because, again, fat carries flavor. So they're adding flavor into this product to make it to simulate a meat product. OK, so think about just because you're choosing a vegetarian option doesn't automatically translate to something that is that much healthier. OK, so you just need to be cautious and read some labels. I'm not saying that for all vegetarian products, but best for some of them out there. So don't make that that one to one equation that vegetarian means automatically healthier. Right. And then um, healthy or unsaturated fats. These are the fats that are liquid at room temperature. And that doesn't mean, again, in Arizona, we usually are normally hot versus a snowy day like today, um, where things might that would be normally solid at, at a normal room temperature might liquefy here. Um, but so we're looking for liquid at room temperature oils. So that's the um, olive oil or canola oil or some other type of vegetable oil. Um, nuts and seeds, avocados and olives. Obviously, nut butters are not liquid at room temperature, but that is a healthy fat. Those are the unsaturated fats in that nut butter, so that is healthy for us. Avocados are also an unsaturated fat, although, again, we um, in previous talks we've talked about avocados are a lot of fat in them, even though it's a healthy fat, so we can't eat the whole avocado in one sitting. It's only an eighth of a serving. And same thing with olives. Olives are an unsaturated fat, so good for our heart. But again, there is a lot of calories to them, so I would not recommend just eating them endlessly. Um, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, there's so much out there about the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids for our heart health. Um, the one thing that isn't always um, information that isn't always readily given to us is that eating sources, food sources of omega-3 fatty acids, specifically from fatty fishes like salmon or mackerel, are better for our heart than a supplement. And that the, they're not sure in the research studies why that is, but there is something that happens when we digest that food product and absorb it, that, that omega-3 fatty acids are better utilized in our bodies than a supplement form. So if you can eat fish, if you're willing to eat fish, we recommend that twice a week and that's why, because the supplement isn't as well utilized by our body. Right? So those are our heart healthy foods. You guys are gonna be dreaming. Vegetables, fruits, whole grains, <laughs> low fat dairy. I feel like I just said this last week to you all. So keep that in mind. All right, foods to avoid, salt, sodium. So. Salt is the, is the layman's term, but I think everybody's pretty familiar with sodium. So what can we do around salt and sodium to avoid those kinds of things? Um, and I put the recommendation on the side here. So um, the recommendation for the U.S. Um, adults is right around 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day. The upper tolerable limit is about 2,300 you actually watched your sodium intake and you actually tracked everything that you ate, you'd probably be pretty surprised where there's a lot of hidden sources of sodium that you wouldn't even normally think about. Um, so, but some, and, and I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to do that because most of us can do a pretty good job of keeping it below that 2300 just by making some simple um, changes to our diet and just make, and just paying attention to what we're eating. Um, don't add salt to your food when you're sitting at the table or even when you're cooking, unless it's required for part of a baking process that it, it needs the salt for a reaction. Um, use other seasonings. Sorry, lost my tone. Use some other seasonings. Try some. You can even go Kenzie Spice favorite store. You can go into a spice store and ask them. Okay, I'm making chicken, what, what would you suggest? And they will give you so many great ideas. The internet is full of ways to season your food with other um, spices other than salt. Be adventurous, try some different things. Or maybe see what your food tastes like just without anything extra on it. 
it might be a whole new food for you. I used to ask, has anybody ever eaten a potato um, without anything on it? Not many people would raise their hand, but I bet now, does anybody ever try potatoes with just nothing on it? Yeah, see, a couple people do. Um, when I talk to kids about nutrition, I tell them to eat their vegetables naked and they think that's funny, but think about that. Most people put salt or butter or cheese or ranch or something on their vegetables. And so if we try eating them just plain, they might be a whole new experience for us. Um, reducing the use of processed foods is an easy way to cut out salt in our diet. Salt is a huge preservative that we use. Salt and sugar are two preservatives that we use here in the United States a lot. So if you're reducing how much processed foods you're eating and making more home cooked fresh meals, you're gonna reduce your salt. Uh, avoiding those canned soups and vegetables and in very tiny letters, no, it's not so tiny there. I did say except beans and tomato products. For the purpose that beans, to cook them from dry form is a lot of effort sometimes for a single person to do, to cook a big crock pot full of beans. Maybe it's not, maybe you don't mind doing that. But for the average human, me, who's lazy, I do not like to cook that, go to that much process to cook my beans. So a tip if you're gonna use canned beans to get some of that extra salt off is to rinse them for 30 seconds and let them drain for two minutes, okay? And that will take off about 30 to 40% of the extra sodium that's on there. Even if you're using a low sodium version of that bean, which is even better, and then you rinse it off. Um, and tomato products, it's kind of hard to, you know, again, if you're an average human, that you're gonna can your own and make your own stewed tomatoes or stewed and then diced tomatoes or make your own um, marinara or pasta sauce, something like that. So those are okay things to use from the can. And whenever possible, choose your lower sodium um, options, both in those tomato and canned products. And if you're gonna use a canned soup. Uh, added sugars is our next food that we need to um, be aware of and try to avoid. Uh, and most people associate sugar with um, the chronic disease of diabetes, but it also does impact our heart. Um, there is a tight link between heart, our heart health, heart disease, and those kinds of other diseases related to diabetes. There's kind of this uh, trifecta of diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol that all kind of link together. So added sugars are defined as those sugars that are not naturally occurring in a food. And labels have started, and I should have added a label, so I'm sorry, but most labels should have started to add um, under their carbohydrate, they'll have total carbohydrates, and then they'll have sugar and added sugar um, so that you can see what was added to the product. So I think I've used a slide before, yogurt's a good example. Greek yogurt, non-fat plain Greek yogurt, has about 16 grams of sugar because lactose, which is milk, is a sugar technically. It breaks down in our body into a sugar, but it's naturally occurring. That's what's in the food. But if you were to then get a vanilla form of that very same yogurt, the very same um, brand, it would have closer to 28 grams of sugar because they add sugar to make it a vanilla sweetened flavor yogurt. So when you're reading labels, really look for what has been added to that product. And don't automatically assume if you look at something, you know, like a milk, it's going to have sugar in it because it's lactose. If you're looking at something with real fruit in it, it's going to have sugar because there's fructose in fruit. Okay. Here's my caveat though. A lot of manufacturers know that you all are getting very smart about reading labels. And so they've started to use things like fructose or lactose as a sweetener in other products. Because if you read that and you saw fructose, wouldn't you say, oh, that must be fruit. That's got to be healthy for me. And it's not. It's just still sugar because they're adding it into the product to make it more sweet. So that's what I'm talking about, added sugars. Um, and here's how it links more closely to heart disease. I talked about that, that pyramid, but specifically added sugars, we eat a lot of sugar, it's gonna increase our triglycerides. And our triglycerides play a factor in our total cholesterol and how that affects our heart. 
So what's the recommendation? Limited added sugar um, is six teaspoons for women and nine teaspoons for men. That doesn't seem like very much, does it? Especially since we are one day past Valentine's Day when all this candy was out and just a couple months past Christmas and just a couple other months past Halloween. So we're like in the sugar fest, it seems. Um, so be aware of where you're getting all these different sugar products and, you know, aim for that, thinking about how many of those, how much extra sugar am I getting that's added? Unhealthy or saturated fats is the fourth food that you should be focused on avoiding. And these are the foods that are solid at room temperature, like a butter, like a, a Crisco. Does anybody remember Crisco? Yeah. Um, Crisco looks an awful lot like coconut oil. In fact, it looks identical to coconut oil. Coconut oil is highly saturated fat. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about coconut oil. Um, saturated fats raise our bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol. And so that increases your risk for heart disease when your LDL cholesterol is high. The main sources of these unhealthy fats are red meat, are that poultry um, skin that we already talked about, that when you're cooking chicken or turkey or something like that, take that skin off because that's where the saturated fat is. Milk fats, so those whole milks have a lot of saturated fat in them. Um, and then tropical oils and butters, the tropical oils being palm oil, which is like the number one ingredient that they used in baked processed goods that you might get at the store. Um, that's a highly saturated fat. And then coconut oil, obviously, is another tropical fat. And then the fourth one, fourth unhealthy food is um, alcohol. If you choose to drink alcohol, do so in moderation. If you don't, don't take it up because you read a study that drinking wine is, helps to improve your heart health. <laughs> that is only in the case of if you're already drinking alcohol. Um, and then the recommendation for moderate alcohol consumption is one drink or less for women per day and two drinks or less per day for men. And then I gave a little uh, descriptor of what is one drink. So uh, it's a 12 ounce beer. It's not the tall 32 ounce pour. It's a four to five ounce glass of wine, which is really only about that much. It's not this much. Have you seen the memes? My doctor told me to uh, only have one glass of wine and they're holding like this big, huge trash can size goblet of wine. Um, so it's not just about the number, it's about the, the size of the drink. Okay. So those are the foods we should try to limit, reduce, avoid if possible. Healthy eating tips. All right, eating smaller portions. How does this work? How do we, we eat with our eyes. How many of you are like, oh, that looks really good. And then all of a sudden you're hungry or you smell it. But we eat with our eyes. That's why I tell you to make your plate beautiful. Because if you have something on your plate that's really not very appealing, are you less likely to want to eat that? We eat with our eyes. So because so, using smaller plates, using smaller mugs will help us to reduce our portion sizes. If we use our standard large plate and we put a standard amount of vegetable and a standard amount of starch and a standard amount of protein, it's going to look pretty bare because our plates have grown in the past 30 years. I remember our plates used to be like this big and now our plates are like this big on the TV. That's uh, big. Um, so that makes our eyes want more food because we need to fill in our plates, right? Thanksgiving, we need to have every surface covered with everything. So thinking about using smaller portion or smaller plates and smaller cups helps our eyes, tricks our eyes a little bit that, oh, okay, that's a good size portion because I'm filling my plate. So think about using a salad plate as your dinner plate. Think about using a juice cup as your standard drinking cup, except for water. Use a big, biggest thing you can find for water, okay? Um, eat slowly and mindfully. How many of you are fast eaters? Okay, there's not many of you, you guys are good slow eaters. You wanna take at least 20 minutes to eat your meals. The reason being, if you eat your meal really fast, 
you're not going to give your stomach time to recognize that it's full and send a signal up to your brain to say, hey, we're done. And that's when you like all of a sudden, you've had to have done this. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, wow, I'm really full right now. It's because it's caught up with you. Um, I do that a lot because I eat too fast. So slow down. Take a bite. Chew your food. Set your utensil down. Have a conversation. Okay. Pay attention to what you're eating. Eating mindfully. This is my example of not eating mindfully. I ate a whole sleeve of saltine crackers while I was working on a presentation or a budget or something. I literally did not know I did it. I actually asked my person in the next office, I'm like, did you come eat my crackers? I had eaten a whole sleeve because I was so focused on what I was doing and I was just mindlessly putting crackers in my mouth. I did not feel good after that. But so using our brains to help us and maybe doing little tricks by using smaller plates, smaller cups, really focusing, looking at your food can help us reduce how much we eat because we're really paying attention. Okay. Uh, drinking water and drink water often. Often we think we're hungry when we're actually thirsty. Has anybody ever experienced this? Yeah, I'm automatically, I need something, I must be hungry. I really actually just need a big drink of water. So before, if you've already eaten and you think that you, you're kind of wondering why am I hungry, try drinking some water and seeing if that helps satisfy that, that feeling. Um, and it also kind of fills us up a little bit when we drink some of that water, if we're not ready to eat yet. And for your heart health, being dehydrated can lead to an increase in your blood pressure. So staying well hydrated might help if you have any kind of blood pressure issues. All right. And plus we live in the desert, so it's always good to drink water. Planning ahead. Best intentions mean very little without a plan when you're hungry. I'm going to go home and I am going to cook those vegetables and I'm going to use some of that leftover chicken and I'm going to, you know, make some nice um, quinoa and I'm going to have a great dinner. And I come home and I am starving. I don't have any quinoa. Shoot, my kids ate the chicken. What am I going to do? I am not going to go to the store to go get those two items. I'm going to find something else. Very convenient and probably not as healthy. So you need to have a plan and you need to have a backup plan because life gets in our way when we're trying to make some healthy choices. And especially if you're trying to do any kind of modification or change your eating habits, um, make sure that you have a plan. And if you don't like to meal plan, I don't like to meal plan. I'm not supposed to say that as a dietitian, but I don't. Um, but what I do do is I know that I always have certain staples that are in my house that I can say, okay, tonight your choices are fish, chicken, or something, you know, something else with these three things on the side. What, if, what is that? What combination there do you want? And those things I always have on hand if I haven't planned something specific out. So it's very easy to keep fish frozen in your, in your freezer or to keep some shredded chicken. You know, if you cook up several chicken breasts and shred it and just put some in your freezer, just as a, just in case. It's very easy to have cans of beans. It's very easy to keep a box of brown rice or quinoa ready to go. So if you're not a meal planner, make sure you have some staples that you can always turn to. And the frozen vegetables, excellent to always just keep in your freezer. I always make the frozen vegetables thinking that's going to be my prime part of my meal. And after the kids roll through, we got a lot of kids. I'm like, where did my vegetables go? They eat them every time. So maybe if you don't think about what you're going to, you know, oh, nobody's going to eat this. But if you haven't seen it in a while, you might want to. So, and then um, before I move on to the next thing is never, ever. And I mean ever, never. This is your one tip. If you don't do anything else, just don't eat right from the container. Because a container is likely a processed food, whether it's a chip, whether it's a cracker, whether it's a sugar or something, a cookie or a, a processed popcorn. 
don't ever eat from the container because I can guarantee you're not just going to have two of whatever that is. And so you're going to eat a lot of salt, you're going to eat a lot of sugar, and you're going to get a lot more calories than you ever intended. Because when we eat right from a container, we eat mindlessly. Okay? So portion it out and then go off about your business wherever you're going to eat that, that snack or that processed thing. Um, because in every situation, you will always eat more than you intended. Right? Okay. And then, of course, the old, old saying, everything in moderation holds true every time across the board. It is okay to have a treat, an indulgence, as Larry would call them, of chocolate or of a chip or of a cracker or of a cookie, but in moderation. Again, don't sit down with the package. Don't do that every single night. Everything in moderation. So keep that in mind. Fads, myths, and truths. All right, eggs, since we're talking about heart health, how many of us remember when we can only eat two eggs a week because they were high in cholesterol and we loved eggs and we can only eat two a week and it was such a treat to get those eggs. All right, well, eggs are high in cholesterol and therefore raise our blood cholesterol. We now know that dietary cholesterol, so cholesterol we find in eggs and or shrimp or other kind of shellfish, do not raise our blood cholesterol. It is actually the saturated, the LDL or the saturated fats that raise our blood cholesterol. So that's why we want you to choose low fat sources of meat and low fat sources of dairy because that saturated fat increases our bad cholesterol. So the recommendation from currently from the American Heart Association says that most health, most everybody, um, unless you have some extreme cholesterol level or some other extreme um, medical condition going on in which your doctor will have told you this, um, they say that we can eat up to seven eggs a week. So that's one egg a day or two every few days. Here's what you can do if you love eggs and you like to eat eggs every day, but you want two eggs every day, is you could do one whole egg and one egg white. There is no cholesterol or fat associated with the egg white. That is pure protein, okay? And it just increases your volume. So you could have one egg, get the taste of that yolk, and then have another egg white to give you some volume. So seven eggs a week, yay! Coconut oil. So here's the myth and or, there's a little truth to this, that the reason that we want to eat coconut oil is because coconut oil is made up of medium chain triglycerides, which get absorbed very quickly and converted to energy very quickly. That is true about medium chain triglycerides. However, the truth of this fad or this myth is that the commercial grade coconut oil products that we get in the store um, are not medium chain triglycerides. They have been modified and are 80 to 90% saturated fat versus um, that medium chain triglyceride. Okay, so that is why there is a lot of controversy around coconut oil because in theory, it should be good for us it should give us energy and it shouldn't impact our blood cholesterol, but in practice, because of the way it is produced commercially, it is not work out for us, okay? So coconut oil used for flavoring. If you're making some sort of Asian dish or some, some kind of ethnic dish that coconut flavoring would be really great for, Use it for that seasoning, but don't use it as your primary source of cooking oil and don't, don't eat it off a spoon twice a day. That's bad. You're going to have some unintended effects from that. I had somebody come in, she goes, I eat two tablespoons every day. I can't figure out why I've gained 10 pounds in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> mm, I, I got nothing for you. Sorry. Okay. Whole fat dairy. So. There is a lot going in the last three years about whole fat dairy versus low fat dairy, right? Have you guys heard this? And everybody wants us to eat whole fat dairy. And now you see all this new whole fat dairy stuff back in the, in the cases at the grocery stores. 
Um, I go to coffee stores and they only serve whole milk. I'm like, well, what is happening to this world? Okay, so here's why. There is, um, so I started this off by saying nutrition is a fairly young science. And we're learning about nutrition and how it impacts our health. Every year we learn a little bit more. So here's a situation where whole fat dairy, some research is saying one thing, some research is saying something else. And so our position as the, um, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is going to stay with what we know for sure. All right. So that's why you might be hearing all these different things. So there has been some research that has said that eating whole fat dairy doesn't actually impact our risk for cardiovascular disease. That for some reason, the saturated fat that's in whole fat dairy doesn't increase our bad cholesterol. That is yet to be proved on a very large study, but it still may be. So I'm not going to say that's false. I'm just going to say the um, studies that have shown that are still too small for us to change our recommendations. There are other studies that have shown high or that whole fat dairy products have a negative impact on the um, um, survival rates of people with breast cancer. So there's that flip side. We have some research that says it's okay for us to do because it doesn't affect our cardiovascular health. We have some that says, but it may you know, affect our survival rate if we have breast cancer. So there's, we have these two competing things. The recommendation is to choose wisely if you're going to choose whole fat dairy. Don't choose a lot of it. Um, the American, um, sorry, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, we still recommend choosing low fat dairy, that whole fat dairy products should not be consumed by anybody over the age of two. Okay. So do with that as you wish. I am certain that there will be much more research that comes out in the next two or three years about whole fat dairy and we will have a little bit more of a conclusive, you know, be able to weigh the, the data a little bit better. All right, so eggs good? Yeah, coconut oil, still not good. Bah. Whole fat dairy, gonna recommend not to do it, but may change in the future. All right, that was my favorite slide right there. All right, so some healthy habits because we know we can't just eat healthy food and then not do anything else to improve our heart health. So number one, we need to sleep better. Raise your hand if you're like an Olympic sleeper. One. Wow, I want to be you. Okay. So it started off that, you know, I don't know. There was a generation of us that were like, yeah, we don't need sleep. I get by a four hour sleep. I'm a rock star. And it was like a badge of honor that I don't need to sleep. Okay, well that not sleeping is impacting our health. It causes um, increased risk for coronary artery disease um, and stroke. Because without sleep, we're not allowing our body to recover, to repair and to get itself back on track ready for the next day. So we need seven to nine hours of good quality sleep. If you aren't sleeping well, we have a whole neuroscience sleep center right here at TMC. They can do a sleep study for you. If you're not getting great sleep, start off by wondering, okay, do I go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time? I will tell you that is their number one recommendation. You need to be on a consistent pattern, even on the weekends, even on vacation, bed at the same time, up at the same time. Don't nap for three and four hours during the day. Now it's gonna impact, I, I know, right? It's like my favorite thing. Um, number two is don't nap too long. Quick cat naps, 15, 20 minutes, okay. Three and four hours. Think about your sleep hygiene. How long is somebody on their phone, tablet, or something else with a blue light before they go to bed? 
All blue light emitting products, even if you wear the glasses, still should be turned off about 90 minutes before you want to go to sleep, okay? Same thing with eating. You should stop eating 90 minutes before you go to sleep because it takes your body that long to get rid of all those chemicals that you're using to process in your body that says that we're awake and we're using this food for energy. We want to help our body realize it's time to go to sleep. And then lastly, think about your room, your environment. Is it dark? Is it cool? Is it clutter-free? Those are three key things right there. Aromatherapy, either through plants or through room sprays, you know, satchels of um, herbs can be also very helpful in your environment to help with sleep. But the light, both from your screens and ambient light and temperature are two big keys about sleep. Okay. Being active is so important for our heart health because it gets that heart rate up and it allows it to recover. That's part of what our heart does. It goes up and it comes down and we want it to be able to do that regularly and know how to do that regularly. Um, it keeps our heart fit. So we want to do at least 150 minutes of moderate to intense exercise every week. That really isn't that much. That's 30 minutes, five days a week. That's so easy and it can be broken up. It can be 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes at night. It can be 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at lunch and 10 minutes in the evening. It could be a five minute extra walk around the store before you go into go grocery shopping. 30 minutes, five days a week. It's super easy to get in. When I say moderate to intense, and I have talk versus sing here. If you're able to sing while you're walking along, you're not walking fast enough. You should be able to talk and make sure that you can ask for help if you have some issues. But if you're carrying on a full conversation and singing, you need to exert a little bit more effort. I went walking with somebody um, up to Mamak, and she was just blah, 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 blah. I'm like, holy heck, how are you talking up this hill? You need to look. And then I realized that she was talking, so I didn't have to talk. So I was like, oh, yeah, that's good for you. Um, but, uh, yeah, she's in great shape. Clearly, if she could just cruise up to a monk. But think about that. Don't want to be able to sing. Maybe sing in your brain if you like to sing while you exercise. Expressing gratitude. We've been hearing a lot more about gratitude over the last five years. Um, and these feelings of gratitude actually help to improve our mood and help to reduce our stress. And thus it helps to um, reduce our risk for heart disease. It kind of goes with the laughter at the bottom here, um, that being happy and, and being joyful decreases um, our stress levels helps to reduce our blood pressure and helps to re reduce our risk for heart disease. So those two things kind of go together. So whether it's saying it to somebody, whether it's writing it on a note card, or whether it's just journaling what you're grateful for, those all are ways that you can express gratitude. Maybe it's just a, a conscious thought that you have every night as part of your bedtime routine about what am I grateful for today? What went well? And then that can help to reduce our blood pressure and make us sleep better and help reduce our risk for heart disease. It's also easy because everybody has smartphones or some sort of device that we can text somebody. Maybe it's your habit that once a day you text somebody new and say thank you for something specific for them or appreciate them in some way. Um, managing our stress, and I underlined in healthy ways. So managing stress doesn't mean that we call our friends Ben and Jerry. Um, and have them over for the evening. <laughs> Managing stress is, might be through listening to music. It might be through visiting with friends. It might be through exercise. It might be through reading. These are all healthy <laughs> options versus putting something into our body that is not healthy that we use as comfort. So there's a difference between comfort and actually managing our stress. Stress is that is helpful and healthy in some cases because it's that natural flight or fight and it gets us going. But if we maintain a stressed um, 
environment, or sorry, if our body is stressed over a long period of time, our cortisol levels go up, they stay up. And um, this is can increase our risk for heart disease. Okay, so find those healthy ways to cope with that stress. And laughter might be one of them. So um, if you need a stress relief, there are so many websites that you can go and um, say that you want to subscribe to a daily comic and get a daily comic show up on your phone every day. Um, or you could join um, a free meditation app that will give you things to read or help you um, do a little meditation at the beginning or end of your day. So those are some ideas. All right, so here's your recipe. Doesn't this look yummy? I did not make this, but I could. All right, so this is zucchini banana bread um, because it was cold yesterday. And who doesn't like a nice warm piece of um, fruit vegetable bread? So you're going to use some zucchini, some banana. We're using um, unsweetened applesauce and honey as our sweeteners in this and whole wheat flour. So we get that extra whole grain in there. Um, it's super easy. Mix it all in one bowl pretty much and um, goes in the oven. And you can add other things. We have a little dietitian tip there on the side, um, such as other dried fruits or some nuts um, or even um, a few dark chocolate chips in there. And you can make this recipe vegan by um, substituting flaxseed egg for the actual eggs. Okay. All right. It looks really yummy. I hope you guys can read it on your handouts there. What questions do you guys have? Oh, I'm going to start with online first, though, huh? Yeah. So thank you, Mary. And actually, I just had a question come in um, asking about calcium. And is calcium, an that? Issue, is calcium an issue with heart valve trouble in older adults? Um, with, uh, with heart valve? Yeah, heart valve trouble on older adults. Is calcium an issue? I guess I'm, I'm, I'm envisioning maybe blockages from calcium. So too much calcium? Yeah. That would be a conversation they would have to have with their doctor. It's not something that's in the literature that we um, advise that folks with um, heart valves don't drink, um, have dairy, or have calcium sources. Okay. All right. So not that I'm aware of, but it would be something definitely if you have a heart valve, a new heart valve, old heart valve, check with your doctor. And, and maybe we have a talk coming up on Friday about slowing cardiovascular aging uh, with a cardiologist. So that might be a great question that to would be ask him as well. Yes. Um, what about um, sources, alternative snacks, you know, if you really crave salty chips, what would be a good alternative for somebody to, to utilize instead? So some great alternatives for those salty chips. I can't really give you a great alternative for salt, but um, nuts are a good alternative um, because you're getting that healthy fat, you're getting that crunch, and most nuts have salt on them. Um, those tortilla chips that I was talking about, that if you just cut up a corn tortilla chip, you can shake them in a, in a Ziploc bag with a little bit of olive oil, and then you can add seasoning to that, whether it's pepper and some chili powder to make it spicy or garlic powder, something like that, and you bake them. Um, they bake very quickly in less than 10 minutes, um, and you have crispy chips that way. Or Air Pop popcorn is another great alternative to that crunchy, salty snack. Great. And what about any non-sugar alternative snacks? What recommendations would you have for that? Um, so here's what I would say for that um, would be a dried fruit and nut trail mix might be a good option because you're getting some protein with that dried fruit that is sweet. Um, you want to look for the dried fruit that doesn't have a lot of added sugar to it. Um, which you might find at some place like Trader Joe's or Sprouts might have a little bit less processed dried fruits. Um, other non-sweet snacks, let's see, graham crackers are a pretty good low sugar but still sweet. And same thing with like vanilla wafers. They're a good option too. 
And when you're looking at dried fruit, at which dried fruit do you prefer that somebody might use as a snack? I know, I, obviously I know like when you look at the mango, a lot of it has the sugar on the outside and whatnot. Okay. So. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not supposed to eat those, okay. No, um, again, it's it's like you said, already said, Maya, it's anything that doesn't have extra sugar already added to it. So a lot of the mangoes do, but they also have versions at um, I've seen at um, Trader Joe's and Sprouts that don't. They're just plain dried mangoes. Um, cranberries is another one to be cautious of that a lot of the cranberries, the craisins, they have all these great craisin flavors now. Yeah, it's all with added sugar. So cranberries are kind of hard to find without added sugar. But if you're looking for something tart like a cranberry, um, they have tart cherries, dried cherries that don't have a lot of added sugar to them often. And I, you know what, tart cherries and some dark chocolate is, yeah. is pretty yeah. divine. So, <laughs> so mix it um, in nuts. Yeah. And what about on the full? I know you were talking about the full dairy, um, full fat. You know, yes, that are out there right now. What um, What's your recommendation, particularly maybe around yogurt? Is it because uh, I know you have those options? You have the full fat, you have maybe the two percent or the one percent, and then the zero. What would What would, should somebody be looking for if they're going to maybe have something like a, a yogurt? So the best yogurt choice starts with the non-fat, plain Greek yogurt that then you add your own fruit to, or maybe drizzle a little bit of honey or maple syrup on whatever your sweetener of choice is on top. The next best, it's always going to stay at the non-fat is are going to be our choice um, for a yogurt. And Greek yogurt is our primary first choice because again of those live active cultures. Your next best choice beyond a plain is um, whatever flavor has the lowest amount of added sugar, which generally is um, vanilla. Okay, great, perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to the room for any questions and we'll wrap up with our online audience. But this was great. You gave so much uh, information for folks to really, um, get a good idea about what they should be doing for to be heart healthy. We will share this presentation uh, with the online audience if they registered so that they can get your recipe as well. So thank you. Thank you for that, Mary. And uh, we will see you. We'll see you on our next talk. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much for being here today. We do have another heart health talk coming up on Friday. That'll be uh, this Friday, February 17th at 1 p.m. And that will be our prevention to slow cardiovascular aging with Dr. Greg Koshkarian, who is with Pima Heart and Vascular. If you are interested in that class, please give us a call at 520-324-1960 and we can get you registered. Thank you.